everybody, uh, if you can put your uh, helmets on that you can find on your chairs uh, in order not to be disturbed by the other sounds around here in the middle of uh, the conference. Uh, hello everybody, thank you very much for joining. My name is Tudor Gallus. I'm a privacy consultant uh, in uh, a boutique uh, company uh, named uh, after me. <laughs> We are working with over 150 customers across Europe, United Kingdom, and the United States. And of course, we are opening up new projects across the world. Um, as a background, we are doing this for the last uh, four years. And before that, I've been a marketing executive in Microsoft for over 14 years and a half. So I pretty much know the business environment, enterprise, and of course, small and medium business. That's why today we are going to talk about a very interesting subject, which are cross-border personal data transfers within the big data processing scenarios. Uh, I'll make a small advertising, uh, advertisement. At 1.30, we have a panel in the main uh, keynote room, together with my colleague Terry here, and with two other experts, we will be discussing general uh, GDPR and privacy issues related to uh, big data. This is more of a specialized presentation and you'll see why. First of all, I will start with outlining some of the key facts about privacy regulations and big data. In the past years, we've seen hundreds of privacy fines which were delivered since May 25th, 2018. That's the date when GDPR entered both in EU and in UK. But what's interesting is that these privacy fines were not mainly in European Union, as everybody might think. In fact, in the United States, in terms of fines, the level of fines and the number of fines, they are much bigger than ones in the European Union and the United Kingdom. Despite the fact that the United States are said to have a more lax legislation, they apply it better. Okay, much better than EU and US uh, in, uh, and UK. And that is very interesting because in the United States, regulators understood very well what are the challenges related to processing big data and big amounts of data and they started chasing the so-called big data brokers, such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, and others. While in European Union, things moved a little bit slower. Okay, more. But the fine is not the worst thing that can happen to a company. I keep repeating this to my customers and to all the, all, uh, the other companies that I meet with. Why? Because you're thinking, yeah, it's a fine. If I know fine, I can maybe budget it. The problem are the so-called corrective measures. And uh, for example, the Italian Data Protection Authority issued a big fine to one of their telecom operators in the level of tens of millions of euros, which is big. However, they issued also 20 corrective measures, which required them to delete all marketing data, redesign their internal processes, redesign the marketing consent processes, redesign how data is stored, clarify their privacy terms, clarify their internal procedures, 20 corrective measures. Imagine that suddenly a regulator tells you, hey, you need to delete your marketing data that you actually worked on gathering for the past, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, and the regulator asks you to delete it. So that's a big challenge, and it might cost you 10 times the level of the fine. Next one is that privacy compliance is a risk-based approach. Actually, you need to understand all the risk within your organization. Actually, the difficult part is that you need to put yourself in the shoes of the so-called data subject, in the shoes of your employee, in the shoes of your customer, in the shoes of your partner. And you need to make the assessment, the risk assessment, from that perspective, what can happen to a person? What can happen to a person if the data is exposed? What can happen to a person 
if the data is destroyed, if it's stolen, if it's hacked. Think about all that happens with ransomware. For the first time in history of humankind, we had a crime, actually a murder, in fact, in a hospital which was hacked and the database of the hospital was encrypted. It was a ransomware attack and the patient died. It was for the first time when a hacking attempt led, when a hacking uh, attack led to the death of a person. Also, data governments become super challenging when we see so many regulations. These are privacy regulations, CCPA, CPRA, this is California, CDPA, CPA, these are in the States, LGPD, China, the new China privacy law, which is very, very tough, very interesting. And UK, UK is about to issue a new privacy regulation. They are saying they want to change the GDPR, which is of course good. Each time such a regulation should be updated from time to time. But these are changing. I mentioned also AML, anti-money laundering. The anti-money laundering regulations around the world are becoming very challenging in big data scenarios. Why? Because actually transform, it transfers part of the law enforcement responsibility towards banks and financial institutions. It's their role to investigate whether a transaction might finance terrorism or money laundering. And that is super difficult because you need to analyze huge data sets. At the same time, privacy regulations like GDPR and the other ones, PIPEDA and LGPD, are saying now you need to respect the principle of data minimization, which means providing the minimum amount of data necessary to reach a certain scope. Now, AML, privacy regulations, they're banging head to head. And that's a big issue because I asked many regulators in different countries, how are you going to approach this? How do you realize if the data processed is not excessive? How do you realize if a bank, which let's say didn't process enough information because they were afraid of the regulation, failed to notice a transaction that is actually financing terrorism and uh, uh, money laundering. So that's the challenges we are facing. So the question is, how do we handle that? Well, first of all, we need to understand a little bit the terminology. Despite the fact that it seems so simple, we know what's personal data, we know what's PII. The truth is, things are not clear at all. Think of the following. So the definition is, this is the simplified version of the personal data definition that you can find in both EU GDPR and UK GDPR. It's any information that can lead to a direct or e indirect identification of a person. Direct identification means, hey, there is a photo. Oh, there's John. Indirect identification means, hey, there is a photo. I have no idea who is in this photo. But some persons should know these persons in the photo or a machine might detect who is that person in the photo. And this is why it's challenging. Let me add to the complexity. There is a regulation in EU, which also was cascaded to UK and still in the legislation of UK, which is saying where personal and non-personal data in a data set are inextricably linked, regulations shall not prejudice the application of regulation EU. Let me translate this for you. If you have a data set, containing personal data, if that personal data is strictly linked to the data set, the whole data set is personal data. Okay, this is the level of complexity. And let me add to this level of complexity. Um, the behavior of a person. So let's say you have a monitoring system, okay? An IoT, let's say you have an IoT. And you're gathering a lot of data from this IoT, which is GPS, how that person moves, health data, different parameters, battery consumption, and so on. So you have a data set related to the IoT of a person. And you're saying, yeah, I want to anonymize this data set. What would you do usually? Eliminate the identifiers, right? The unique identifier of the watch, 
name, surname, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, customer ID, user ID, etc. Eliminate them, right? What do you do with the behavioral data? Is that behavioral data unique for the person having the watch? Yes? Yes, it is. Each of us walk, run, talk, and whatever we do differently. It's unique. It, it can lead at some point, not today, but maybe in the future, it can lead to our identification. These small toys, these IOTs, are is ex extremely, uh, I mean, they are processing extremely sensitive quantities and um, categories of personal data. Because when we are looking at them, we're actually looking at the device which is monitoring 24-7 what we are doing in our lives. How dangerous are they? Not, not in just terms of not using them, but think about several years ago, a secret US training facility, military training facility, was discovered in the Middle East simply because of the fact that the soldiers were running, holding their smartwatches, and they shared their results on the int. So basically, everybody saw that at a certain time of day, there was a circle drawn in the middle of the desert. So this is how they realized there should be, there might be a secret US military base. And it was exposed. And this is just I mean, military data, okay? This is why we need to treat these types of uh, data in a very, very sensitive manner. Just to better understand, we have data sets and we have personal data. The question is how inextricable are these two? For example, if we are talking about insurance, and insurance, okay, in insurance, actually you are Again, um, looking after the personal data of that person, actually seeing if that person had health issues, if you are talking about a health insurance policy, if he had uh, driving incidents, if we are talking about insurance, and so on. So if you want, let's say, to make an analysis, okay, um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, what's the middle age of those persons involved in accidents on that street and so on. If you want to make a report, you understand whether you are or you are not processing personal data. And what do you anonymize? And let me tell you what is actually the challenge. And this is a whole related to international transfers. A lot of companies are saying, yeah, but we anonymize the data before we export the data, before we send the data into other servers. And I always ask, what actually are you anonymizing? Again, you actually need to make sure you're eliminating those data sets which can lead directly or indirectly to the identification of the individual. What is really hard these days, and you as professionals in big data, you understand this better than everyone. Technologies are developing so fast that soon all the data that we are thinking was non-personal data actually re-becomes personal data. I think in the future, anonymization will be a nice dream. In fact, anonymization is mostly pseudonymization. I mean, let me need some identifiers making it hard for somebody to identify that personal data. But honestly, it will be almost impossible to fully de-anonymize personal data. So, what's the authorities' opinion related to big data. The good thing is that authorities understand the level of uh, importance of big data. By the way, yesterday, UK government published their AI strategy for 10-year AI strategy. I've, I don't know if you, if you received the news. It's an amazing strategy, and it recognizes the importance of big data. Why is this so important for you as big data professionals? Because once authorities publish a strategy, they will modify the legislation to adapt it to the strategies, part of the tactics. This is politics. This is what politicians do. So most probably you'll see the regulations adapting better to match the context of the strategy. 
clearly everybody agrees big data is important and authorities should embrace big data and of course AI. But at the same time, they should make sure that the individuals are respected. Why is this important? Because GDPR, whether we are talking about EU GDPR or UK GDPR, and in general, every privacy legislation is built upon the human rights, the chart of human rights. And in the chart of human rights, one of the most important rights is the right to privacy or to right to intimacy. In fact, it's the right to intimacy. Actually, all these legislations are only clarifying this human right, the right of intimacy. They are giving clear clarification and context. It's just a set of better understandable and easier to understand norms for companies. But in the end, the human right is there and that's the thing that every company should respect. Now, what are data transfers? This is where the, games, the game gets interesting. Actually, you won't find any clarification in any legislation in terms of transfer. I mean, if we are to think, you know, with common sense, transfer is moving one thing to another thing. But recently, EU authorities said, for example, if you are accessing a database from a remote location, that is transfer. If you have, for example, I'll go and make it more complex. If you put a video of persons, you know, in a certain room, if that video is hosted, let's say, on YouTube servers in US, if a person from Kenya sees that video, is that a data transfer? It is a data transfer. That's why this is a quite a gray area. Also, proof of transfer. We often say we didn't transfer data to that server. How can you actually prove that? Because access is also a transfer. So if you implement logs, you implement traceability. We will talk about this also in our panel about traceability of the data to actually understand how did you collect it? Did you put the right context to it, the right metadata? Did you actually put the right characterization of the data? Only in that moment, you'll be able to trace that data. Because again, transfer is not actually the process of copying some digital information from one place to another. Even simply accessing it is a transfer. So you need to make sure how you're actually processing that data. The difficult part is with multinational companies. These days, I have at least cases where we are discussing about the headquarter who wants to access sensitive human resources data from the subsidiaries. Let's say the headquarter is in the United States, or I don't know, in um, India, or in China, or in Russia, or in Europe. And they say, hey, we want to have access to the data of our employees because in the end we are the headquarters. We are kind of somehow through some complicated financial processes paying these employees. We have the right to actually access the data. We want to make studies. We want polls. We want to process big quantities of data related to these employees. And they, they are saying, we are not transferring data. We'll be accessing your instances of software as a service applications locally or local HR solution. Give us access to your local HR solution. And we will do the reports on your tenant. And this is not data transfer. Oh, yes, it is. And this is how you should analyze this. This is a good example of a data transfer. Now, what should we take into consideration when we are talking about data transfers? We can look at this from top to bottom or from bottom up. Top to bottom, who? First of all, understand who exports the data, who imports the data. Usually, at some point in time, these roles can be inverted. But actually, during the data transfer, only one entity is exporter, one entity is importer. Or multiple entities are exporters, multiple entities are importers. But the transfer, it's not back and forth. It's always one direction. The reverse transfer is just another transfer. Legislation. What laws are impacting the transfer? 
this is I, this is where I see a lot of mistakes because when you are asking a company what laws are impacting you on your transfer, the first thing they're saying is GDPR and it's the privacy legislation of the country. No. You have financial regulations, which might require you to expose data on financial invoices or financial justifications. You have employment laws. For example, if you are hiring an expat from one country to another, you have specific legislation in the, both the countries. You have surveillance laws, like you have now in UK, or like the one in the United States, which led to the fall of uh, privacy shield. Uh, you have multiple laws impacting the transfer. So you need to make sure you understand all these laws. Access, who has access to transfer data? And I'm not talking about oh, our employees. No, authorities might have access to your transfer data. The, your um, uh, internet connection provider might have access to transfer data and so on. So you need to understand all the actors. How? How can impacted people exercise their rights? That's a really good question. For example, if my data is transferred, I don't know, some other country, how do I understand how can I exercise my rights, which are under GDPR, in that country? This needs to, made, uh, uh, this needs to be made transparent. Sensitivity. How sensitive is the data exported? This is a very painful question because what outrages me is to see that many organizations are looking at, ah, it's just email. It's just name and surname. It's not sensitive. We are not processing sensitive or special characters of data. The Ministry of Defense in Britain leaked two emails containing the names of Afghan collaborators in Afghanistan. And many people realized that a simple data breach could lead to the death of innocent people. This is what are the effects? What can happen to those data subjects if the data is, is leaked? Basically, risks. How often is the data transferred? Recurrence. And what is the legal ground and scope for transfer? This is very amusing. Usually I put this question at the end. Why? Because this is when companies start explaining, yeah, we need that HR data because we actually need to understand what our employees are doing. But OK, let's go more in depth. Why do you need that data? And most of the times, actually, they do not need the data. They could be just fine without that data because you could receive anonymized data. You could receive reports, and reports could be made right in the country where, let's say, the so-called exporter country. So actually, remember that in GDPR you have, and in most, most of the legislations, you have the so-called minimization principle, data minimization. How can you make sure that you reach the purpose of the thing with the minimum amount of data? And usually we are always managing to actually do this for our customers, basically eliminate redundant categories of personal data. What you need to understand is actually you can process and can do exports in a compliant way. Imagine the fact that when Privacy Shield collapsed last year, all the companies went crazy saying, we won't be able to transfer data to the United States. Wrong. You can transfer data to the United States. And this is one of the most visible cases. Doctolib is basically the platform used by the French government to manage the vaccination process for COVID-19. All that was saved in Amazon Web Services. Of course, all the privacy NGOs started screaming, no, this is completely wrong. You are breaching uh, the Schrems 2 decision and so on. But they implemented the right decision because the database was encrypted in AVS and the key, the decryption key was held on a French server. So yes, you can deploy the right measure or you can do a huge mistake in deploying the right measures. For example, remember when Zoom, at the start of the pandemic, when everybody was using Zoom, organizations identified the fact that Zoom leaked some of its sensitive transmissions to China servers. And they said, yeah, it was a simple rerouting. No, that was a data transfer. In fact, the fact that you forgot at some point that you had some servers 
in another country used for backup for optimization and for something no that's data transfer make sure you actually correctly map the personal data which is being processed and identify all the resources which are used for processing of data now some resources don't be scared you can download this it's a great guide which is outlining you have here all regulations in countries like australia brazil canada china eu hong kong california virginia colorado with exactly what are the rights of the data subjects such as right to access correct delete portability opt-outs business obligations such as transparency blah scope and enforcement why did i put this list because for example if you're transferring data from eu to let's say hong kong and turkey you need to understand that you need to be compliant to all these laws so you need to make sure that data subjects understand how can they exercise their rights both under eu law let's say and turkish and hong kong's laws how these rights can be actually exercised and here you have exactly the article it's a great resource developed by IEAPP International Association of Privacy Professionals when you are doing a multiple geo data transfer you make sure you understand that you need to comply with all the legislations in the countries of transfer people need to be informed this is part of every every uh, privacy regulation and how can they exercise their rights what are some of the legal mechanisms for transfers and i'll address this with eu and uk gdpr basically you have three options adequacy decision this means a list of countries where you can export personal data just like being part of the union or just like being part of the uk okay Appropriate safe safeguards, which means standard contractual clauses, which were also issued by UK recently, but also renewed by European Union. It's a set of fixed documents where you need to detail uh, the transfer. Binding corporate rules, which can be used only inside corporations. Certification, we don't have yet any EU-wide certification. Code of conduct, we have a cloud code of conduct. How many of you knew about the European Union Code of Conduct, Cloud Code of Conduct, or COC? Two people. Yes, we have a new Cloud of Conduct with the detail level and the detail metrics of hard and soft controls, which, yes, you can use to adhere to the Cloud Code of Conduct if you're working for a, a software as a service, platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service company. So yes, you can make your company adhere to this cloud of conduct and use this as an appropriate safeguard for data transfer. And you have derogations, but derogations are only for sporadic transfers. Transfers made once or twice, not for continuous data transfers. Now, this is also a resource you can download from David Rosenthal if you're if you are going to this uh, website uh, it's developed under open uh, source so basically you can download this document uh, we had privacy impact assessment data protection impact assessment legitimate interest assessment finally we have TIA transfer impact assessment basically it's a set of questions that you need to ask yourself about the transfer and in order to be able to better understand what is actually happening uh, and the transfer as the final key takeaways make sure you're mapping all your personal data processing operations a personal data transfer a transfer is a processing check who has access to the personal data check how the person can be affected by the export subject check the laws of the exporting and of the importing countries how they can exercise their rights related to all the laws TIA, the transfer impact assessment should be performed as part of the formal process of data pro uh, protection impact assessment or DPIA and always ask if you don't know ask your peers 
ask your data protection authorities. Sadly, our time is out, but here are my contact details. Uh, and you, if you have questions, just please uh, come forward. Or you can also ask your questions during our panel at 1.30 uh, p.m. I thank you very much for attending.